Welcome to The Boundary Spanners, a podcast on residential decarbonization with me, Nate, the blue collar CEO of HVAC 2.0. And I'm Abi, a white collar policy researcher based in Canada. In this podcast, we're taking tacit, unspoken and hands-on knowledge from the white and blue collar worlds and turning it into explicit and actionable out loud insights for residential decarbonization. The views expressed in the show are entirely personal. You can follow the Boundary Spanners podcast on YouTube or wherever you get your favorite podcasts from. Thank you for listening. So this is my, and I'm a, I'm a policy guy um, and, and a researcher, and uh, that's that's my day job, although, you know, we both have to say that we're here in a personal capacity. And for the last, I'll say four or five years, I have made a conscious effort to spend more time in HVAC communities. You and I, Nate, we did an episode earlier um, about the white collar and blue collar culture. And we talked about how the pathway towards residential electrification, decarbonization, goes through HVAC contractors, goes through blue collar work and the ability of all these, the best laid plans of policymakers and policy shapers have to rely on the backs of what we broadly call blue collar workforce, the men and women who go into people's homes and fix systems up um, and and replace HVAC systems and do plumbing, electrical and all all of these things. So for me, and and you and I, we talked about this and we, we were lamenting the fact that blue collar worlds and white collar worlds, again, broadly speaking, seem to be drifting further, further apart. It's not only that that the implicit and explicit and tacit knowledge domains of these worlds are different, but also culturally we're different. We may be watching different TV shows, we may be shopping at different places, we may even be drinking different beers. And so if knowledge, if we form knowledge about our world, the impressions that we have of our world are constructed socially, by which I mean, if we form an opinion of the world through our interactions that we have with the world socially, what does it mean when white collar and blue collar communities inhabit different social realms? Does that also mean that our, the way that we think about problems, the way we conceptualize solutions and the way that we approach these intractable problems like residential electrification, does that mean that we will be drifting further apart in how we define these problems and try to come up with solutions? I really do think it does. Um, so I want to tell a story of my own prejudice where I hated myself for it. Mm. So um, back when I was, I think I was just out of high school. I hadn't gone to college yet, but uh, so I was like, it was that summer. I was working for my dad. And uh, part of what we do is we'd stock the fridge with pop or soda, depending where you live. And uh, um, we'd sell to the guys. It costs like 35 cents a can, something like that. And so I was up there and I, I had bought just a ton of stuff. It was like a thousand bucks of stuff. And it was really heavy on a cart and it was heavy enough. I was nervous about taking it to the truck because um, the parking lot was bumpy and it wasn't super hilly, but it wasn't dead flat. So uh, it, as I walked out the door, this kid comes up to me and he says, Hey, I'll watch that for you while you go get it. He didn't have a name tag on or anything like that. And he was African-American and I ran to the truck nervous that he was going to steal my stuff. And I got back and everything was fine. He was there. Um, and I thought, wow, I'm an asshole. So we, we, we talked uh, a little bit and here he was also going to be a freshman the next year at Teal College, which was 15 miles from Grove City where I was going and he was playing football. And I'm just like, if he had white skin, I wouldn't have been nervous. And like, I didn't realize that I had that prejudice in me and I hated myself for it. Uh, so we all have these internal prejudices that we don't even realize or acknowledge. And in my view, the last acceptable prejudice in society is white collar versus blue. Oh, you shouldn't go do that. Like go, go to college. You don't have to do that job. Um, Like that's a common prejudice now. And having spent my whole life back and forth, like, so one, I'm guilty. Um, Like I catch my own thought processes uh, doing that. Like, well, no, I don't need to pay attention to that opinion because he's just a worker. Um, That is a horrible way to live your life. Um, uh, You're invalidating someone. I mean, so many problems on earth come from invalidating people that are different from you. Right. Um, So to go to your example, where you talked about meeting a a young gentleman 
uh, and realizing it and, and coming to face with like your own, you, you call them prejudices surfaced, right? And, and you were able mm -hmm. to see them for what they are. And, and this is part of what like forums, like, you know, we talk about social construction of knowledge. It's not like you read an explicit book that said people who look a certain way or talk a certain way are not to be trusted. But that idea is formed through uh, your cultural background experiences and how you navigate, you know, and through repeated, in, like, like through like through osmosis, we absorb things that we read and we see yeah. and, and then we form these tacit ideas in our head. And especially where we are today in 2021, culturally, I think, you know, we, a lot of us are, are looking like you did at, at trying to second guess our knee-jerk reactions that are often formed through like, you know, tacit and implicit in knowledge uh, and ideas that we have and examining that and trying to think of, and trying to transcend that and trying to act in yeah. ways that we expect of ourselves. And then what you're saying then is an extension of a similar set of prejudices. is the last acceptable, the more and most enduring a prejudice seems to be a discrimination against people who may be less credentialed than you. Yeah. I don't want to even, I don't want to even say less educated than you because, you know, my, someone very close to me used to always say, don't let school get in the way of your education. <laughs> so if you think about education as a lifelong project, then what we're talking about here at the end of the day is credentials. You know, do you have, are you credentialed in, you know, there's different ways to which we establish knowledge, right? So if you have a PhD, you have certain credentials. If you don't, if you're a, if you're a blue collar worker, then you have certain credentials. You have set different ways of expertise and the way in which we afford, the way in which um, people with different levels of expertise get to set and define expectations or set to define rules and set to define uh, programs and projects and priorities for uh, goals that we commonly share is uneven. We've talked about this before. Um, when you look at, I know I live in Canada and municipalities here over the past four or five years are all developing like local energy plans, you know, with bold and ambitious targets to get to 2050 energy goals, climate goals, and so on. And then when, when you read who is a part of like the advisory committee that's helping them put these programs together, uh, not often as someone who without a college degree reflected on there. Yep. It's not often like the blue collar men and women who will have to end up doing a bulk of this work. Yeah. I don't know that their, that their priorities are their value systems or their knowledge domains are represented. There, there are there so be... many problems with that. There's so many problems with that. Um, I mean, it's a, I, I think of uh, uh, like Colonel Klinger from uh, uh, Hogan's Heroes. You will do it and you will like it. Um, you know? Right. Um, and and, and we, we... you can't do that to people. Like, I don't want to be treated that way. You don't want to be treated that way. Yet we design programs that treat the people that actually do the work that way. And I'm like, why are they pushing back? Um, and the other piece, I mean, I'd like to take a step back. Like uh, you, uh, we had mentioned culture war last time, like be very careful just using the phrase climate change because it tends to trigger people just as using the, the word capitalism triggers some people um, where I just view it as a thing. I don't view it as good or evil. It's a tool. Um, so, I mean, I firmly believe that the main reason that Trump rose to power and a whole lot of the the conflicts that we're seeing, and this is across the, the world. I mean, France had the yellow, uh, was it yellow coat? Yellow, yellow jacket? Vest. Yellow, yellow vest. vest. Thank you. Yellow vest um, uprising, which was heavily uh, blue collar workers. So we're creating the schism and then either ignoring it or being like, eh, the tamp down, shut up, let them eat cake. Um, and uh, we're, this is not good. So uh, yes, we're talking about just residential electrification here is, is the, the narrow view of what we're looking at. But the broader view is this is affecting our lives. Um, it's affecting our mental health. I mean, it, Trump was a hard president to have. Not that I want to get political, but it, it, you couldn't get away <laughs> because there was always a tweet. I, just Man, I live in Canada. I live in Canada and I couldn't get away. And I'm yeah. not even American, right? And, you know, it's just... <laughs> so... Yeah, it affected our mental health, but we there, that that is the reaction, or that's the end result of a schism, that I largely think relates back to white collar versus blue. It's not entirely, but that's that's pretty close. So there's a couple of things you said there that I think is worth unpacking. So the first thing is that um, while this podcast is about residential electrification, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. Right? You know, when I, when I was in physics, you know, we talk about uh, frictionless spherical cows in a vacuum because that's the ideal, you know, like ideal conditions. Yeah. You know, you can model that, but once you start adding friction, you get, you know, all these second order, third order effects. It's the same thing. Like our residential electrification doesn't exist in a vacuum. You cannot just look at that without situating it in the broader 
political and cultural context of the world that we're in today. Correct. And the second thing you, you were talking about is um, sometimes, you know, it seems like policymakers talk the big talk about including communities and listening to frontline workers and just transitions and incorporating workers, the, the experiences of workers and prioritizing them in transitions and stuff like that. I, and this is my personal reflection on this, is that I feel like policymakers still do not understand the priorities and there's a lot of tacit knowledge about the residential electrification uh, space that escapes the scrutiny of policymakers. And I, as someone who's you know involved in, in research and in policy, I wanted to do the work, so to speak, and, and spend time in, in quote unquote blue collar communities. So I, I joined online communities of practice. You know, I, I taken classes at a community college uh, to get like my gas certification, so I can you know mm -hmm. moonlight as a as a HVAC installer when I if and when I get the time. So, but 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 the purpose of my foray into blue collar uh, workplace and work spaces is so that I can better understand and have a a very and to tap into that tacit knowledge of so of the blue of blue collar workforce upon whom mm -hmm. policy shapers and makers and policy writers and analysts like me have to rely on if we are to get to our ambitious energy and climate goals. And it might be worth explaining what we mean by explicit and tacit knowledge. Yep. You know, so the way I understand it is explicit knowledge is like the most basic form of knowledge. It's things that you can write down and pass on to someone, rules of thumb. If you're giving someone an address and say, well, you go there and turn right, take, take a couple of rights at the next intersection, you'll get to the space. That's Explicit knowledge. You, those are things you can write down, you can convey to someone else uh, by writing things down. It's the most basic form of knowledge, right? Implicit knowledge is practical application of uh, explicit knowledge. So what this means is um, if you using the same, you know, giving directions on a map analogy, implicit knowledge is you know because you've been driving in Ontario that you can take a right at an intersection, even if the right is even if the light is red, and you know it because you spend time in Ontario and you live there. And of course, yes, there's explicit knowledge up, out there in front of you with that. There's only you'll only see a sign if up uh, that says "Do not turn right," but not a, every intersection doesn't have a sign that says you can't turn right. Some of it is just implicit knowledge. If you're driving in Ontario, you'll notice people doing it. If this is your first time, you may not have even read Ontario Road Road May User Manual. You just know by observing that's implicit knowledge. Tacit knowledge is even more ethereal, ethereal, and even more subtle than that, even more ingrained than that. Tacit knowledge is is your instinct. I I know I, I can almost complete your sentences sometimes because, like you and I have had many years of association, and I have an instinct about how you act, how you behave. If there's a movie that I watched, I would know, but within a reasonable degree of certainty, whether you'd like it or not. And it's yeah. not you haven't written down themes of movies that you like. It's just, I have an instinct about it. And I can't even explain to myself why I know what I know about how you feel about certain things. Yep. See, implicit knowledge I can explain to someone. I can say, I know in Ontario, you can turn right on a red because I've seen other people do it. Watch and observe. But as tacit knowledge is even more fundamental than that, it's deeply ingrained and you watch and observe and you don't even know how you know these things, but you can just have an instinct. And this is, and when you move to a new country- Enough experience, yeah. You, you don't have- an, and you don't have knowledge. tacit knowledge about yeah. anything. I've told this story before. When I first moved to Michigan, uh, a buddy of mine invited me over to his home for Thanksgiving, and we actually drove for more than 12 hours to go to his parents' place. Oh, wow. Uh, this was my first Thanksgiving, and we like left at six in the morning, got there around supper time. And his mom asked us, I, uh, Are you guys ready to eat? Are you guys hungry? Do you want food? You must be tired after a long drive. And I immediately said no because. In India, when you go over to someone's place and they ask you, do you want food? You say no. And then you ask, they ask you again, you say no mm -hmm. the second time. And then they ask you the third time. And then you're like, oh, well, I guess if you're going to twist my arm, then I will indulge only if you insist. <laughs> but this is a social dance that I didn't even realize we did in India. Yeah. No one told me in India, you have to say yes the third time. It's just something yeah. deeply ingrained. I didn't even know that I knew that. And my instinct was, as soon as someone said, you want food, when I'm at my friend's place, I said, no. And then I would ask That me was again. the wrong answer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm actually hungry. Yeah, yeah. And they didn't ask me funny. again, because like the tacit knowledge in this domain here in America, back then in Michigan, was when someone says they don't want something, don't force them. 
Yep. And then I was too embarrassed to, because as soon as I said no, they're like, okay, they left me alone. And they were all having fun. And I was too embarrassed. <laughs> oh, man, I'm oh so you just went hungry that night. I went hungry. Um, you know what I did? I, oh, man, this is embarrassing to talk about. You can't see it because of my tan, but I'm blushing right now. <laughs> I, I, I slunk across the, high, the, the road. I, I slipped out of the house. I went across the road uh, to a gas station, and I ate a frozen burrito that night. <laughs> Um, because I didn't have tacit knowledge of this domain. Yeah. And so. That, that's, and so that's a key thing. Um, so could, could I define it the way that I have it in my mind? Yes, sir. Um, so uh, it, explicit knowledge to me is written down or it's, it's somehow like it's, it, it, it has been formalized in some way. Uh, mm -hmm. It's written down, it's, it, it's spoken, um, but I mean, it's, it's no longer in someone's head. Tacit knowledge to me lives entirely on someone's head. Uh, so I mean, what we're trying to do here is take tacit knowledge of you and I and uh, you know uh, uh, others that are working in the electrification space and make it explicit so that hopefully we can keep policymakers from inadvertently nuking our chances of actually getting there. I mean, that's, I've told you for years, my, my main reason for being on Twitter is to help reduce the odds of policy screwing us. Hmm. Because basically anything that touches the kitchen table, which is pretty much every program ever um, uh, when it comes to efficiency programs, anything that touches the kitchen table creates friction and ends up hurting the adoption of whatever it is. Um, or if it helps, it helps temporarily. But as soon as you take it away, the system is now worse than it was to begin with. Uh, like I'll give one specific example. The, the Dominion gas uh, rebate program that I worked with, before it came into town, there weren't a ton of energy auditors in Cleveland, but you know, say there were eight, something like that. This was before I was an auditor. I was just an installation contractor. I had no interest whatsoever in being the auditor. I'm like, I just want to get the work done. Um, but uh, Dominion came in and paid auditors. And then they created this program where homeowners only had to pay $25 or $50 to get an energy audit. It was, it was a turd. Um, it was like, hey, if you do this, you can save $2,000 a year in gas. Well, I only buy $1,500 a year in gas. So are the, can you make out the check you know, to my name? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a lot of that going on. Like the, the programs weren't good. But the problem was it killed the businesses of all those auditors that were out there. I don't think there are any left in Cleveland right now. So that program came in and ironically ended up destroying a burgeoning industry, or at least there was something there and now it's gone. Um, and that is an unintended consequence of that. So I, I want to like, that's now tacitly in my head, but now it's explicit. Um, so there's an interesting parallel here between your journey and mine, uh, because you went to Twitter, which I mean, let's be honest, it's a white collar space. It's, it's educated professionals, yep. credential yep. professionals who are yep. trying to communicate with their peers. And uh, so you, you, you are, I would argue probably the best, one of the best known you know, blue blue collar, so quote unquote, predominantly blue collar, mm -hmm. uh, frontline, HVAC workers who uh, who's you went on Twitter so that you can turn your test knowledge into explicit, so you can then communicate that explicit knowledge with people who occupy that space. Correct. And so my journey was parallel in the other direction. So like you and I, uh, we, we passed each other like two ships in the sea. You know, so I mm -hmm. as a you know quote unquote white collar. I mean, I'm, like you, I you know I've worked in blue collar professions before, but. Predominantly, my career arc is, is white collar, white, yeah. and I wanted to be better at my job as a as a white collar, someone who helps understands researchers, studies, and helps develop policy. I wanted to have a better understanding of the tacit knowledge in the blue collar space. So I've intentionally been spending more time in the blue collar space. That's the background of this conversation: is that you and I are are in a way our, our project here, broadly defined, is to take the tacit knowledge in these spaces and turn it into explicit, so that we are communicating across these different boundaries. Yes. So in this.